So I left here on Thursday, had the sermon all done, all printed, had a big day on Friday to get some things done. And yesterday, Cheryl and I are out shopping, and she said, oh, by the way, remember tomorrow is Pentecost Sunday. Well, I hadn't taken that into account when I originally wrote the sermon. So I spent a good part of the day yesterday revising the sermon, and that's the reason why the scripture uh, was different. Essentially, you can see that the title of the sermon is the how, the why, and the wherefore. So I basically revised the why section. So um, I'm praying that God will be honored uh, in all that we say and do today. Last week, you may recall, we talked about the absolute necessity that Jesus made very clear that we must be born again. He gave us no option. He said, truly, truly, with a double amen, truly, truly, I say to you, you must be born again. And the last thing that we had Jesus saying was in verse 8 of chapter 3 of John, in which he said, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. In other words, what Jesus is saying to us so far in this conversation with Nicodemus is that the Holy Spirit is sovereign and incomprehensible, but he does allow us to recognize and hear his voice as our hearts are open to him. And I believe he's also saying, so the one who hears the voice of the Spirit and receives by faith, the communications of the Spirit is thereby born of the Spirit. Let's pray. Good morning, Father. And what a wonderful morning it is to be gathered in this auditorium with brothers and sisters who love you, who know you as Lord and Savior, who desire day by day, moment by moment, to know more of you and to know you more clearly and dearly. And Father, there may be among us today or from among those listening and, and watching that there may be one who doesn't yet have that assurance, that blessed assurance that even though we are deep and helpless and hopeless in our sin that we can know for sure the hope of eternal life because of what Jesus the Christ did on the cross. Father, if there is such a one among us, I would pray that before that one goes about his or her business after this service, that they would do so knowing that you are the Savior, knowing that they have indeed been born again, born from above in you, in your love and in your mercy and in your grace. So, Father, we ask now that you would be with us, that there would be no doubt that surely you are in this place and that all that is said all of the thoughts that are evoked and all of the deeds that we are motivated to do henceforth would bring you all the honor and all the glory in Jesus' name, amen. So Jesus has spent a little while now opening the heart and the mind of this good guy Pharisee, Nicodemus. And again, he, he ends 
where we left off last week by telling Nicodemus that the Holy Spirit is going to do what he will do. And so it's interesting because the next thing that happens is, is worthy of contemplation. So beginning in verse 9, we read, Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I had told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. In verses 9 and 10, which begin with, Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And then Jesus replying, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you don't understand these things? So what then is the how of all of this, of this particular discourse? Nicodemus asking, after Jesus has made it pretty clear, Jesus assumed, I guess, Jesus knows everything, so he doesn't have to assume anything, but you can clearly see in Jesus' response that there's still a little bit of a gap in Nicodemus' understanding. So Jesus has just explained that this new birth is made manifest by the Holy Spirit. And yet Nicodemus still doesn't understand how this can be. Furthermore, Jesus pointing out Nicodemus's high social and spiritual standing as the teacher of Israel, and yet still not understanding, I would think after Jesus rebuked him in that way, that he probably at this point had Nicodemus's undivided attention. Again, put yourself, let's put ourselves in the place of Nicodemus. Put ourselves in the place of somebody who is face to face with God the Son and has now been, and I'm sure lovingly, rebuked. I'm believing that perhaps once Nicodemus was now giving full attention and was now tapping into what Jesus reminded him of, that Nicodemus, you are one of Israel's teachers. In other words, you really don't have an excuse for not getting what I'm telling you. So it may well be that once Nicodemus was fully engaged now, mentally and spiritually, he may have hearkened back, for example, to Deuteronomy 36, where it says, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. That clearly is not a physical instructive. It's a spiritual instructive, the circumcision of the heart. Jeremiah 31, 33 says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. Once again, 
This is not a physical thing. It can't be done in the flesh physically. In the spirit, whatever God wants to be done can be done. And then in Ezekiel 36, 26, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh once again. Sounds physical, but it's not. It's spiritual. And finally, if we hearken back to Ezekiel 37 and verses 1 through 14, we have that beautiful account of the dry bones and the spirit breathing life into those dry bones. And what all that means would be a wonderful subject for another day if it's appropriate to do so. The point is this, that Nicodemus as a Pharisee, as a teacher of Israel, as somebody of high status, both socially and spiritually, it's surprising that he would have to ask Jesus after Jesus had gone through the explanation of what it means to be born again, it's surprising that he would have to ask him, how can these things be? Now, before we get too comfortable and think uh, that was Nicodemus' problem, let's confess that that's our problem as well from time to time, isn't it? How can these things be? You may recall that just a, a few weeks ago we talked about that awful question, why is, why is there still evil in the world? It's the same idea here. We forget, we forget that it's God who is sovereign. It's God who is holy. And it's the Holy Spirit moving and working and breathing in us to do that which we cannot do on our own. That's the answer to the how. The sovereign, loving, incomprehensible power of the Holy Spirit. That's how. And then Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, once again, the double amen, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, but you do not accept our testimony. We, we speak of what we know. So who, who are the others that Jesus is including with himself when he says, we? Some would say, maybe it's the prophets. Some might say, maybe John the Baptist, because certainly John the Baptist and Jesus were testifying at the same time, the same message. And then some would say, maybe it's the Father and the Holy Spirit, because we know that our God manifests himself to us in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I would submit, how about all of the above? How about all of the above? Because there certainly were times when the prophets testified and spoke in the power of the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist certainly testified and spoke in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus most certainly, as the Son of God, has the right to be a part of that we, a part of that triunity of Father and Son and Holy Spirit. But here's what's interesting. Here, here's, here's the thing. Jesus then says, you do not accept our testimony. Now, what's interesting here and what's instructive is that the Greek for you is a plural 
word. So even though Jesus is face to face right now with Nicodemus, as, as always happens in the scripture, Jesus is not just talking to the immediate audience. He is speaking to all of us, past, present, and future. So this conversation took place 2,000 years ago. Jesus' use of the plural, you, transcends time, and he's speaking to us just as surely as he was speaking to Nicodemus. So Jesus then is not just rebuking Nicodemus, he is by extension rebuking all who will refuse to accept the gift that is being offered. And then he goes on to say in verse 12, if I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Hmm. So Jesus here is distinguishing teaching about earthly things from teaching about heavenly things. And in one sense, he already answers part of the why here because the question may be, well, why, why don't we just learn about heavenly things? Heaven, heaven sounds like such a wonderful place. Why can't we just focus in church on how great and wonderful heaven is? Well, Jesus answers the question. He says, you don't even, you're not even able to comprehend fully in your own flesh the earthly things I'm telling you. So why do you think for a moment that you could even begin to handle what's in store for you in heaven? Now, it may seem a little strange to call being born from above an entrance into the kingdom of God earthly but they are earthly in the sense that they refer to the effects of divine activity here on earth. For example, in Acts 2, verses 1 through 8, we were reminded that there were devout Jews from far and wide who had gathered to celebrate this uh, established holiday, Pentecost, the Hebrew name for this holiday was Shavuot, and basically it was, a, it was a harvest feast, sometimes called the Feast of Weeks, because it had to do with uh, seven weeks, 49 days, and then the harvesting. So you had the planting, and then 49 days later, the harvesting. It also coincided with exactly 50 days from the Passover. So these devout Jews from all over the world the known world, were here to celebrate Pentecost. And as Steve read, suddenly there came this sound, this uh, mighty rushing wind, and it, the apostles had been gathered uh, in, in a particular place, and the place was filled with the Holy Spirit talks about divided tongues being on tops of their heads and fire appearing and being filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak so that as they spoke, all the different folks from all the different nations representing all these different languages could hear them and understand them in their own language. And to say the least, everybody was bewildered. And they were amazed, the scripture says. And they were astonished. And they said, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it then that we hear each of us 
in our own language. So we've already answered that question because the Holy Spirit is sovereign and incomprehensible and yet able to do what he will. So then the question becomes now, why do some understand while others choose not to accept the gift? Well, in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, we get a clue. In their case, meaning those who refuse to hear and accept the good news, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Jesus Christ, who is the image of God. In our flesh, brothers and sisters, absent the Holy Spirit, we are blind. We are un unmovable in our flesh, in and of ourselves. So because the gift of the Holy Spirit is the result of being born of the Holy Spirit, we can make this declaration from Galatians 4, 6. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Because of God's sovereignty and God's love and God's mercy, You who will, we who will accept this free gift to no credit on our own can be called sons and daughters of God. And then finally, Peter states what I, what I believe is the ultimate manifestation of this being born again, of the acceptance of this free gift when in his first epistle, in chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, this is what Peter is inspired to write. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. Well, look at that, my brothers and sisters. Being born again and all of the wonderful things that accrue from that God instructs us through the Apostle Peter that the ultimate manifestation is that we love one another. Whoa. If you were expecting some humongous, unheard of theological treatise, it's not there. We don't need it. It's what Jesus said and did and demonstrated and repeated every recorded moment of his life that we are to love one another. That's, that, he says, is how all men will, will know that you are mine if you love one another. Another. That's why it's good to be born again. Because now we can love one another as Christ not only loved us, not only taught us, but demonstrated to us 
on the cross of Calvary. Jesus came into the world to die. And yet the three years that he ministered were the three most incredible and unforgettable years in the history of mankind, in the history of civilization. So Jesus has put himself in his proper place in our hearts and minds as the ultimate authority. And he puts us in our proper place as intellectually and spiritually helpless and hopeless without him. And then finally he declares, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the son of man. Wherefore, by that statement that we just read, Jesus asserts the following. He asserts that he existed before he appeared on earth. He asserts that heaven is his true abode. And he asserts that on earth, his spirit has ever been in communication with heaven. John 1.18 says it like this. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who was in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. The one that came from heaven, the only begotten son, is the only one worthy of declaring him in the way that is absolutely and irresistibly and unequivocally sovereign and divine. Proverbs 34 says it like this. Who has ascended into heaven or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has bound the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? If you know. May I submit that we cannot naturally discern the things of the Spirit of God. That that's the first message that Jesus is giving us here in this conversation with Nicodemus. We cannot naturally discern the things of the Spirit of God. Jesus' own revelation of gospel truth shows the folly of those who will not take these truths seriously. As God, Christ alone is fully able to reveal the will of God to us. And finally, it is only as one is born again, as revealed by the one who is fully God and fully man, that we can even begin to hope to discern that which is of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, that even in our thickness and our depravity, in our spiritual density, that for reasons known only to you, you love us with a love beyond all measure. And in your word, you reveal to us exactly who you are and whose we are when we, because of your love and your mercy and your grace, accept the gift 
of the Holy Spirit when we are born again from above. Thank you, Lord, that you're a God who loves beyond all measure. You're a God who sees into our hearts. You're a God who exists beyond time and space. And yet, you make it clear that a home is being prepared for us even now by the Lord Jesus Christ, that where he is, those of us who know him and love him as Lord and Savior and High Priest, those of us who are born again as Christ and Christ alone would have it be so, that we can expect and have the sure hope of a home for eternity with you. And that before that time comes, Father, that you give us ample reason to continue to live and love and grow in all that you would have us do and all you would have us be. And most of all, to grow in our love for each other as we grow in our love for you. We give you all the honor and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>